Well, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a great honor to be able to participate in this, this historic event. And I, I share the, the enthusiasm of the, uh, of the speakers uh, that this is really going to be a transformative event. And so I want to start off by um, really congratulating you on, on the launch of this Technion Integrated Cancer Center. And again, I think the, uh, I just want to dwell briefly on the notion of integration because I think we are on a frontier where close integration of basic cancer research, engineering, uh, computational sciences, and clinical research is, is really going to enable breakthroughs in, in cancer therapy. And so I think this is exactly the right philosophy and that you're building a new cancer center from the ground up. And I can say that with enthusiasm because I moved from San Francisco to Lausanne, Switzerland to be part of another Institute of Technology, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, it, with a similar vision that we're trying to build from the ground up a new integrated cancer center, very much like the one here, and I, I hope that we'll have fruitful interactions with the TICC. So I, I believe in this philosophy, and we're trying to make it happen. But I'm not here to talk to you about our cancer center today. I'm here really to, to, to provide some perspective into the cancer problem, which has already been alluded to uh, by uh, all of the previous speakers. So the war on cancer, have we won it 45 years on? And obviously, uh, the answer is no, although we've won some battles, and you heard uh, some really spectacular examples of that, including from uh, the fruits of the uh, ubiquitin discovery. Uh, but you know, that's un unfortunately a rarity, and, and that's why, of course, we're, we're inaugurating this new cancer center today, because otherwise, the, you know, if, if the war on cancer was won, we wouldn't be here. So uh, a premise that I'd like to raise is that, you know, to eventually win the war on cancer, and I'm not as optimistic as Aaron, but I think it's a great uh, strategic goal, but I think we are going to win more battles against particular forms of cancer, but to do so, arguably, we need to better understand the enemy. And I think this is no different than fighting ISIS, that you've got to understand the enemy uh, if you're going to effectively battle them. So I'm just going to, for the general public, I'm just going to give, uh, give you some general thoughts about, you know, what is cancer? Well, cancer is fundamentally a disease of uncontrolled cell growth and an ex chronic expansion of well-behaved cells in our body where normal cells uh, under, be, begin to proliferate aberrantly, and as they proliferate, they, be, they acquire additional capabilities that, that eventually uh, progress into symptomatic disease, which uh, can be lethal. And so cancer originates from alterations in the DNA code of our chromosomes, mutations in genes. And these cancer cells or tumor cells have altered programs that cause them to stop performing uh, their duties as normal members of the society of cells of, and organs of our bodies. Instead, they become outlaw cells that are reprogrammed for proliferative expansion. Cancer arises in dozens of organs and cell types in the body. There are multiple subtypes of organ-specific cancers. There's hundreds of genetic aberrations that can drive tumor growth. There's dizzying genomic disarray and histological variety in what we see in cancer. There's remarkable diversity in, in severity and pathogenic consequences for the affected individual. And there's disconcertingly transitory therapeutic benefits for many forms of human cancer, including for these new generations of very expensive, very sexy, very exciting targeted therapies. In many cases, the benefits are remarkable, uh, but transitory, and, and I'll come back to that. So in some, I mean, can't, you know, the, the problem we face is that this is one disease, class of diseases, but it's, a, it's just an extraordinary, uh, one of extraordinary complexity at all levels, gen genetic, hist histological, pathological, prognostic, therapeutic. And so how can we rationalize this complexity? I mean, this is, it, it's hard to think about all this complexity and, and how do you make any sense of it? And are there common principles underlying this daunting diversity? And in a series of conversations, Bob Weinberg and I, uh, who's a professor at MIT, uh, you know, raised, uh, developed a, a line of thinking, which, which was that the disparate cancers share fundamental qualities. And that this daunting complexity merely reflects different solutions to the same challenge, which is that cancer cells must surmount multiple barriers and roadblocks blocks that are used by the organism to prevent expansive cell proliferation. 
barriers which can differ from organ to organ, and therefore the solutions are different. And this line of, of discussion led us uh, to pose in 2000 and reiterate in 2011 uh, the notion that the cancer could be in some way rationalized, this complexity, by the acquisition of a series of discrete hallmarks of cancer. And so this was a, a hypothesis for rationalizing the complexity of cancer, and it's had some resonance, which I guess is why I'm still here talking to you about it today. And so I'm just going to walk you quickly through uh, the notions of the hallmarks, that, that there are eight acquired functional capabilities that allow tumors to do something active, to do things that normal cells should not, and typically to do them chronically rather than during the carefully orchestrated activities of cells and organs in the body. And the first hallmark is, is sustaining proliferative signaling. And this, of course, is the most obvious one because cancer is a disease of expansive proliferation in the number of cells uh, uh, resulting in, in dispersed or tumorous masses. And so really the notion here, the accel it's the accelerator is on full speed ahead. So we have signals to instruct cells to grow and divide that are present chronically, rather than the transitory signals that are present in normal tissues, which, which divide in a very stereotypical fashion and then cease div dividing. The, the second hallmark reflects the other side of that coin, which is there are uh, growth suppressors, which, which actually serve uh, as breaks that, uh, uh, that to prevent cell proliferation, and invariably we see these breaks or tumor suppressor genes have failed and that signals to stop are, are, are disabled. A third hallmark, which is, so these are all somewhat quasi-distinct from each other, as I think you'll appreciate. A third one is resisting cell death, because it turns out, Nobel Prize winning discovery, that, that cells have an inborn capability to undergo what you might call assisted suicide, and in particular, uh, cancer cells uh, can commit suicide, um, but they, they, the ones that we see in symptomatic disease abrogate this protective mechanism that normally eliminates, el eliminates aberrant cells for the benefit of the organism. So again, protective, another barrier, a protective medicine mechanism uh, of inducing cell suicide. The fourth hallmark is another Nobel Prize winning uh, discovery of, of en uh, enabling replicative immortality and that we now understand that there's this accounting mechanism on the, on the ends of the linear chromosomes that, that clock every time a cell divides and a chromosome is replicated and, and this counting mechanism uh, will, will actually shut off cell division when a preset limit is reached. And cancer cells uh, actually abrogate or short circuit this counting mechanism by a variety of mechanisms, most, most generally through the induction of an enzyme expressed in stem cells called telomerase, which protects the ends of the chromosomes. So cancer cells enable replicative immor immortality by uh, disrupting this counting mechanism. The fifth hallmark takes us outside of the cancer cell into the microenvironment of the tumor and that nests of cells cannot grow uh, w without oxygen and nutrients like glucose uh, to fuel their proliferation. And the fifth hallmark is the induction of new blood vessel growth, the process of angiogenesis, uh, which feeds and nurtures the growing mass uh, of cancer cells. There's another way that cells can survive, a, a very insidious way, and that's the sixth hallmark of, of activating invasion and metastasis. And, and this, is a, this is, of course, the, the, the hallmark which causes the symptomatic and lethal disease, where cancer cells become gorillas that grow by migrating and invading into normal organs, locally and throughout the body, living off the fertile land and disrupting the function of, all, of normal tissues and, and organs. And so this is another way which cancer cells can expand uh, and survive. The seventh has uh, really been a, 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 has come into focus in the last decade is a hugely exciting area, the notion of deregulating cellular energetics and metabolism, uh, which is really that cancer cells become dynamic and flexible in the way they use nutrients to fuel their growth. So you can consider them hybrid engines. They, they, they use alternative energy sources and alter, alternative way to generate energy uh, from uh, uh, different molecules such as glucose and glutamine, 
and uh, to, and really to re re restructure the uh, the metabolism of cells uh, to provide fuel and biomaterials for cell growth. Because again, normal cells sitting in a tissue are not proliferating, or if they do so, they proliferate briefly. Cancer cells need fuel and biomaterials for, pro for chronic cell proliferation. And the eighth hallmark is, the, is avoiding immune destruction, and that what we now appreciate is that in many cases, the immune system detects a problem and seeks to kill cancer cells, but this attack uh, is, is abrogated uh, in what we see in symptomatic cancers, that they figure out ways to evade uh, or avoid immune destruction. And, and again, this, was a, this is a, an area now where we have exciting progress in learning how to uh, disrupt these mechanisms for uh, ev evading immune destruction. So the hypothesis then is that, is that the acquisition of these hallmark capabilities is in general necessary and sufficient to generate a lethal cancer. And that, that's a, at least a working hypothesis to, to think about some of this complexity. But then how are these hallmark capabilities acquired? And we argue that there's two enabling characteristics, of which the first is, has been known for decades, and that's genomic instability and mutation. And that cancer cells uh, lose the integrity that main, maintains our genome, that as a fertilized egg instructs the development of, a, of an organism as complex as us by really maintaining the integrity of the program encoded in, in the DNA. But cancer cells uh, just have show failures of crucial teams of proteins that protect the DNA of the genome from being corrupted, rearranged, and damaged. And the result is mutations that convey on cancer cells hallmark capabilities. And as was alluded, we now have the capability to sequence very economically the human genome, and that's re revealing in, in extraordinary depth the degree of, uh, of, of genomic instability and mutation that's happening uh, in many forms of human cancer. The second enabling characteristic is one that was less obvious, uh, but has, has come into to focus in the last decade or so, and that's tumor-promoting inflammation. And the realization that even though we think of the immune system as, or we hope the immune system is trying to kill tumors, it turns out that, the, that, that there's a dichotomous relationship between the immune system uh, and tumors. And that is uh, this notion that tumors are wounds that don't heal, and that there are cells of the innate immune system that, that have been designed to fight infections and heal wounds, uh, and they misdiagnose the problem of cancer, and, and immune cells that normally participate in wound healing inadvertently help cancer cells acquire hallmark capabilities and become more aggressive. So the immune system can help us, but they can, it can also hurt us, and, in, and, and, in, and indeed, these inflammatory cells can, can provide many of, of these hallmark capabilities. And that leads us into a, you know, another line of thinking that, that although the cancer cells contain uh, the mutations that are driving the disease, those mutations in genes that drive cell proliferation and, and other hallmark capabilities, uh, tumors are not bags of cancer cells, uh, nor are they are cancer cells growing in a petri dish. Uh, there's really a, a, a complex microenvironment that's created that involve a number of corrupted and recruited normal cells. And so I just want to walk you quickly through those. And the, the bottom line is that tumors are composed of an assemblage of cell types that communicate and collaborate. And of course, the foundation of this are the cancer cells, and there are now, uh, we appreciate many, there's the, this, this instability of the cancer cells is producing dramatic heterogeneity in many forms of tumors, just illustrated here with the notion of, of cancer cells that are invasive and others that are not. But there's incredible complexity now, we realize, in differing regions even in the same tumor. And in addition, there's another exciting dimension, and that is the realization that there are so-called cancer stem cells. These are cells that are more similar to, to the, t the stem cells, the normal stem cells in the body that help preserve uh, the homeostasis and, and the integrity of organs, that, that, that cells that have turned on stem-like properties which help them to survive. And so there's a whole series of, of, of dimensions now of the cancer cells themselves. But in addition, to the cancer cells, there are these recruited and corrupted and, and reprogrammed normal cells. And two of those are the endothelial cells and pericytes, which, which are induced to form the tumor vasculature, which feeds 
uh, the cancer cells. There are addition cancer-associated fibroblasts, which are, which are recruited from normal, you know, their normal support functions for many organs and, and come to populate tumors, along with the aforementioned tumor-promoting inflammatory cells. So these are innate immune cells that normally participate in wound healing and other activities, uh, but instead are contributing to the tumor. And so we're research across the spectrum from many labs over the last 10 or 15 years um, has, has really established that, that these, um, uh, the, these uh, so-called stromal cells that are not mutant cancer cells are very, very important for the, resi the, the formation of the disease, and now increasingly we realize that they're important for the resistance uh, to therapy. And, and so functional studies that have been done have really documented uh, the, the rea realization that of these eight hallmark capabilities, uh, these uh, recruited angiogenic vascular cells and cancer-associated fibroblasts and tumor-promoting inflammatory cells can contribute uh, to, to all of these hallmark capabilities. They can contribute to proliferation, angiogenesis, invasion, um, resisting cell death. Uh, actually, these cell, there, are, there are members of these cells that actually inhibit the cytotoxic T cells that are trying to come in and kill tumors. So these cells are definitely part of the problem. That, and then, so the main point here is simply that although we're all thinking about therapies targeting the cancer cell, uh, the armed forces of the enemy is complex, and these other cells are really important for the, for the initial development of the disease, as well as the increasingly we appreciate the responses to therapy. So that's the, the second point. We've got these hallmark capabilities and the, and the, the, character, the, the characteristics that, that provide them and the notion that this, this is an outlaw organ uh, that is really produced and that that is something we have to understand about this enemy. So then and another thing is that's implicit in all of this rearrangement is that cancer involves reprogramming of the integrated signaling circuits in cancer cells and also in these uh, recruited normal cells uh, to convey hallmark capabilities. And so what we appreciate, very exciting time now, is that you know, so the, the, the cells of our body have integrated circuits, much like the, the complex integrated circuits that we can create. And so there are many circuits within the body, that, within a cell, that, that, that perform differing functions, and I'm not going to dwell on them today except to say that what we now appreciate is that through genetic mutation and also uh, epigenetic rewiring, cellular regulatory circuits are corrupted to convey hallmark capabilities. And so this is a very exciting re realization that we can now chart these aberrant uh, uh, signaling circuits and understand how to interfere with them. And certainly a number of talks at this conference will, will dwell on that. So those, those are the notions that, that, were put, that we put forward in trying to rationalize this vast complexity. And so I think, arguably, that uh, you know, th this concept is helping to rationalize the wealth of new mechanistic data forthcoming from the cancer research community, because this has been a rather resonant uh, concept now for, uh, for, for over 15 years. Uh, but but, uh, but a, an, an interesting question, which I just want to end with, is, is, that, is whether this concept is applicable to the goal of more effectively treating human cancers. And interestingly enough, uh, we now have smart bombs, or so-called targeted therapies, uh, for, for all of the eight hallmarks, as well as the two enabling characteristics of genome instability and tumor-promoting inflammation. So we have, and these are just illustrations here, the, the, the names are not that important, but the key point is that through, through the development of the whole uh, academic and pharmaceutical industry studying cancer over the last decades, we have an, an increasing armamentarium of drugs that target different of, of these hallmark capabilities. And so that seems, you know, is a very interesting development and, and one w which you would think might uh, really be helping us above and beyond the traditional approaches of using nonspecific chemotherapy or radiotherapy to create, to create tumors. And that was the great expectation when we started bringing some of these drugs such as uh, the, the, some of the first ones were EGF uh, receptor inhibitors that, that targeted uh, the proliferative signaling hallmark. But the reality is that most of the time, these, uh, these smart bombs are, are smart, but they're not enduring. And I'll just give you one example of that. Um, so melanoma is an often deadly form of skin cancer. 
and it becomes deadly when it metastasizes throughout the body. So there's a radiological image and, and, and a different one of the liver here. Uh, so it's uh, metastatic melanoma has, has uh, uh, been largely incurable. A drug that was, deve was developed uh, that, that targets the proliferative um, signaling hallmark and uh, through the g mutant genes that were identified. And it has just an, an amazing response. It melts away metastatic disease. In this radiological image, these are normal tissues here, but this is all cancer. So these are, these are sort of normal. And so this, in, in two weeks, this drug melts away metastatic disease. So this is what we would dream about for a targeted therapy. And that's, that's the good news. The, the sobering news is that six months later, metastatic disease is back with a vengeance. And, and so this is both the promise uh, and the challenge that we face, that, uh, th that basically uh, most of the time, these, um, these drugs targeting individual hallmarks are producing dramatic responses, but they're not enduring because the cancer cells are, are, are adaptable. There is a, it's a classic Darwinian evolution. 99% of the cells die, but in that population, because of the instability of the genome and the ability to reprogram themselves, variant cells emerge that are resistant. And this is a very exciting and important area of cancer research now. So the question, so this is in, in this example here, for example, this, this quite expensive drug combination of, of, of BRAF and MEK, MEK inhibitors uh, produces this wonderful response, but most of the time for most patients, it's not enduring. So what is the path forward? Well, I think that the path forward, uh, you, you could hope actually, well, let's target all of the hallmarks and maybe then you know, it would be impossible for a tumor to adapt simultaneously to all of this, which is a nice fantasy, but it's almost certainly unrealistic uh, due to toxicity. But I, so the, the thought that I would like to pose is that, you know, that, we, that we face a future where perhaps by using uh, you know, rational uh, combinations of targeting differing hallmark capabilities, we can put the tumor in a situation where it really can't uh, efficiently adapt to all of these challenges. And so the notion is you take rational combinations, for example, of targeting angiogenesis, metastasis, and metabolism, or you, you activate the, the adaptive immune system and suppress the tumor-promoting inflammation. So there's a number of strategies that one can think about. But even then, they may develop adaptive resistance, but also with new imaging tools and capabilities for monitoring disease progression in the blood and by non-invasive imaging, one can imagine a futuristic battle plan for the war on cancer where we use complex sequencing regimens. And by the analogy to conventional warfare is we don't stand up in lines on the field and march at each other anymore. I mean, you attack by land, by air, and by sea. And so maybe if we, if we imagine sequences, you target uh, immune evasion, but if you see relapse and start detecting it early, you switch to target the oncogenic drivers and then you switch to target angiogenesis and metastasis, again, uh, you know, in such a way that, that perhaps the tumor is, is not going to be able to respond and we can produce a condition of, uh, of enduring response. And so this is sort of a hypothesis for the future, and, but I think that the, that the world of, of cancer therapy is, is certainly into one uh, of combinations now, and this is just a way of thinking about mechanism-based combinations uh, so, uh, organized around uh, these hallmark capabilities. This is a hypothesis. It, it may or may not uh, prove useful. So again, I mean, to end then, I mean, I think the war on cancer, the enemy is powerful and diverse in its manifestations, but we're on a frontier where knowledge about mechanisms of the disease, in, in my mind, is going to produce exciting progress in the battlefields of cancer. And I think uh, that the TICC is going to be part of, of, of that uh, solution. And uh, so I'm, I'll just end and just mention, you know, the Hallmarks concept was developed by Bob Weinberg and myself, uh, who is, a, we've had a wonderful collaboration over the decades. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you.